happened to be here get the chance to join in from the beginning, which sure. we'll just Maybe we should dive into the group and what we're doing or something. Right. Who knows? Mm. Anyway, we're here. Um, let's see now. Suzanne is here, uh, and um, Jesper is here, and Mark is here, and Anton is here, and I am here. Uh, my name is Jonas Wells. I live and work in Sweden as a coordination manager for a coordination agency, which is a very Swedish construct that helps six public sector organizations in their collaborative efforts uh, to do better work and be their best joint selves, I guess, um, working with um, clients who may be struggling. Um, and, um, um, but I'm also, so I'm not a consultant, uh, but I do a lot of training in social work because it's, it's the, uh, preferred mode of working for uh, the organizations that I work for. Um, and it's really good, as you know, uh, to build collaboration with solution focus. Um, I'm just just saying who I am. Um, I don't know, maybe we should do a short introductions. Is that is that one way of beginning? Anton, do you want to say something about who you are for the people who don't know you? Fine. Um, my name is Anton Stellemans. I work in Belgium and Holland and uh, other places, but predominantly in Belgium and Holland as a solution focus coach and trainer. And uh, the last years I've been, been involved in uh, large scale changes in organizations. So uh, that's why I'm uh, so much interested in this topic of uh, macro analysis and how solution focus can help in bringing about large change. Shall I hand it over to you, Mark? Hi, everyone. Mark McCurgo <laughs> here, uh, SF work based in Edinburgh in Scotland these days. I've been interested in solution focused work in organizations for nearly 30 years. And uh, this topic of how do you work with large organizations? So it's not just a question of doing a workshop with a group of people, it's kind of bigger than that that we're thinking about. And it's been great to join in with all these lovely folk to share our cases, share our ideas, and put our heads together. Right. And... Um, great. Should I say something? Yes, please. <clears throat> yes. My name is Jesper. Uh, been in this group as well. I work as a consultant, uh, as a coach as a large group facilitator i go in and out in organizations so i'm not employed somewhere and uh, i think what really interested me when when susan bergstahl uh, sent out this invite was of course to meet the other clever heads uh, and listening to their experiences and thoughts about when you go up a large scale i mean you sit one-to-one -one or you sit with a team, but what is, what is it when you zoom out and go really large scale? This is what I find interesting. Um, yeah. And uh, I see we have Suzanne with us. Shall we, shall we give Suzanne the opportunity? So why did you start this group? What, what was fascinating you at that time? Well, I was, <clears throat> I was always interested. In, but that's the work that I've been doing, working with, with organizations um, and organizational development. And when I heard of microanalysis, I thought, shouldn't we also, you know, we're studying these tiny slices of solution-focused conversations. Shouldn't we also be studying the, the large canvases of solution-focused work that we are, that we are doing? Um, and since it's my kind of work, I thought, okay, um, what can we learn from that? And uh, I think I, I talked to Mark about it some years ago in Vienna, and I've been thinking of this study group. And then when the, the opportunity came, when we could do it online, uh, I thought it was actually in a in a uh, solution focused creative silence workshop that I first contacted you, and um, then I thought, okay, I'll do it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it's, we've been meeting for almost a year now, isn't it, Susanna? I think it's one and a half years. More year and a half, or even. Wow. Yes, um, and we've been sharing case examples. So what would, you know, what does large scale uh, solution focus practice look like and, and what kind of settings could we imagine that in and, and sharing 
stories from our own lives um, um, and um, and listening to each other and trying to figure out are there any themes coming up are there things that you know are resonating between us um, um, and learning from each other um, and what this might be um, and um, one of the things that struck me I mean I, I said I work with these six organizations but I also work nationally with lots of different coordination agencies and we've even design one my example was this idea of how we naturally in Sweden have created indicators for what we believe is successful collaboration and that's a huge task but so how do we do that and and, and I'm very proud that solution focus was very much um, present in all the interactions that I was making through emails and through conferences and through conversations and zoom meetings live and uh, meetings and everything um, um and there's something about the consistency the 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 tone the the um persistence um and also the invitational kind of space you know that, that everybody's valued and there's a and there's a um uh, a collaborative way of working uh, which, is, which extends beyond the people you're actually walk, working with just in front of you um, and I find that really fascinating so how do we communicate with people that we don't see and how do we create a tone that kind of reverberates beyond our kind of idea of what, what we think we we can influence um, I find that fascinating that uh, there's something about so how how do we do that you know how is how can we describe that and how can we talk about that and learn from that? That's something that fascinated me a lot in, uh, in this. Um, we had some idea of how we want to structure this time together that we have. I don't know if I should say something about that. The idea was that each of us um, was gonna make one point. Yeah, because there's so many points and if six of us, and uh, then we don't have enough time. And then we want to invite you to share your one point. And I think because I, I thought maybe I'm going to collapse today, I'm, I did a little video, um, but I think I can say it. I think I'm feeling feeling okay <laughs> Feel, sharing my one point. And actually, it's um, it's more about what we've been doing in the or what we've been finding out, an overview of what we've been finding out in the solution focused macro analysis study group. So as I said earlier, we get these big canvases of solution-focused work. Yeah, work with organizations, work in between organizations sometimes cover several years. Yeah, so um, what we you, you can't study in detail several years. It's not possible. So um, what we were looking at or looking for is the broad brush strokes. Yeah, of the <clears throat> of the work, and that somehow uh, corresponds to to the, a structure. Yeah, a large painting also has to have a structure, um, the the structure, uh, the design, and we were looking and identifying actually that there is a solution focused aesthetic also in large scale organizational work. So that was one point, and then of course there's lots of um, in between bits. Yeah, the structure is being filled with many, many interactions. So there's lots of micro or meso within the macro structure. And with that, I mean um, conversations, workshops, large group interventions, spontaneous conversations, maybe working with an exec executive team, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? And um, again, um, it's important, you know, we, we were taking probes of that and, um, and then um, having a look and see how, how does that fit uh, together with the structure. Yeah. Uh, the third point uh, that, we, that came up in, in the whole of this, in this study, was that because the work in large scale setting, settings is so unpredictable, complex. There's such a multiplicity of uh, conversations, of um, meetings, of written communications, invitations, the way you open uh, an open space, all these, all these little details that the, the way of being, yeah, you can also call it mindset. Actually, I prefer the way, way to call it the way of being because it's not just the thinking, it's how you feel about people, how you translate that into your interactions. So the 
the way of being of the facilitator plays an even bigger role, I think, than in 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 shorter um, or in in more structured conversations where you can follow the you know as Chris said today, where you can follow the the recipe. And um, I think uh, Jonas was going to say more about that, the way of being or, you know, transforming yourself uh, in order to transform the organization. So that was the, the third uh, insight or, or area of study. And then last but not least, because it's a study, a macro analysis, just one vowel change. It's a discipline that's just being invented. So we, I think we've, we also need to be looking at our own methods. So far, as, um, as was said, we've been, basic, we've been basing our, our study on, on cases, um, storytelling by the case owner, reflecting team conversations, uh, questions that are being raised, um, things like that. Maybe also do a little bit of writing together. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, those those are the four areas that we've been studying for the last one and a half years. Now, over to to all the others who hasn't spoken. Maybe we can go up from them from the alphabet and maybe start with uh, Mark, and then Marika. I don't know if Marika is here, but Mark, may I hand over to you? What's your one point? Your one insight from this uh, initiative? Thank you, Susan. Uh, yes. Yeah, so my one point uh, among many that we could all we could all make lots of points, but I picked this one. It's called creating an exploring space, creating an exploring space. And an exploring space is a space where new ideas can appear, be nurtured and developed. So it's not an analysis of old ideas. Uh, it's it's a place where things can emerge. And there's a connection here to the whole world of dialogic organization development and generative change that Jervis Bush and Bob Marshak and others have been working on uh, for the last decade or so. But they, at least, are sensible enough to realize that solution-focused practice has been doing this for much longer than they have. And uh, they created a list of 37, I think, dialogic approaches, which included things like appreciative inquiry and open space. Uh, and solution focus is in their list. And um, so this idea that it's generative, that when we come together in a solution focused conversation, part of the purpose of that is to is that new things will emerge, new new possibilities will, will come that were not there before. And so in order to do that, we have to create an exploring space, a space with, with all the people in it, where these new ideas can emerge. And there are a few things that are really important in that, I think. The first of them is creating a level hierarchy, a level playing field. So in ordinary organizations, of course, there is a vertical hierarchy and some people are more senior and other people are more junior. But I find that when we want to do solution-focused work, the important thing is to get everyone in the room on as level a footing as possible. And so the kind of hierarchical dif differences are minimized while the workshop is going, while the work is on. And of course, the hierarchy still exists outside the room. So part of the thing is when we invite people into the space and to engage in the project, to do it in a way that helps them leave those hierarchical differences at the door. Uh, and so everyone in the, in the space has a voice, Everyone is heard, everyone is valued, everyone is affirmed, of course, as it's solution focused, and everyone is included. Uh, and so that and that's not the normal way of meetings at work. You may you may or may not have discovered. Uh, so so this idea of uh, everyone has a voice, everyone has a contribution, uh, everyone. Uh, and we have processes and, and ways to get make sure everyone gets the space, everyone gets time to, to speak, everyone gets time to listen, and we have processes to help that to happen. Uh, and that also connects, I think, with the stance of what some people call nothing about me without me. So when we are talking about work that will impact people, perhaps uh, you know, clients, end users, people in the organisation, 
they should be there, ideally, or at least some of them should be there. Uh, and, uh, and we should be looking to include the people who will be affected as well as the people who are responsible for, for, for doing, the, doing the work, making the changes and so forth. Uh, uh, and this is a, a very important uh, idea when it comes to the... Um, sorry, I lost my thread now. <laughs> when, when it comes to uh, inclusivity... And, when it, and so the old idea of solution focus was you develop an intervention uh, and then you do it and that will affect other people. And I think the way we've moved uh, over the last 20 or 30 years is, is a much greater awareness that it's better if you involve people from the outset and you develop things uh, which will affect people with them. And of course, not they won't always be terribly happy about it, but at least you, you can involve them and, and include them and have them in the conversation. Uh, and this whole position of um, uh, nothing about me without me is a kind of anti-colonial stance in the modern terminology. Uh, it's, it's not us coming in and saying, here's what you need to do. That's the McKinsey version of colonialism. Uh, instead, it's about us getting people together and we all work out what's going to do. Uh, and it's up to the people in the organisation in the end what they want to do. Uh, we don't want to decide for them. We don't want to imply that they should be like us. And I think that stance has always been there in solution-focused work. And you watch the old tapes of Stephen Insu working with families, and they take a lot of effort to involve everyone who's in the room. But maybe it hasn't been called that uh, and maybe it's because the shift away from intervention and towards uh, conversation and description is such that there's even more scope now to do that. And one of the things, just to finish up, uh, I learned open space work from Harrison Owen himself nearly 30 years ago. And one of Harrison Owen's phrases about open space was that we must take care to look out for space invaders. And at the time, Space Invaders was, of course, a popular video game. But it's his term of people who want to disrupt the exploring space and insist that everyone should do something. Of course, open space, as you will know, is all about making choice. Uh, and you, know, you can choose which conversation to get involved with or, or not. Um, and he says there's very few things. Once the open space is set up, there's very few things for the facilitator to do, apart from take care that nobody invades the space and starts to derail the, the choice. And I, that's a phrase that stuck with me all these years, and I still think it's very important. So we don't want people to be derailing the choice in content terms. We should do this. And we also don't want to be people to be derailing the space in process terms. Uh, so we, we should all have this conversation or that conversation. We want instead this exploring space. And it's a real delicate balance, I think, about the, the, the exploring space, but there still need to be boundaries and there still need to be some limits to, to keep it relatively productive. Um, and so I'm just going to close slightly cheekily by pointing out that I've written a book about hosting generative change and I'm running a four-part workshop about it with the Cape Cod Institute in November, uh, which is a lot about how you invite people into an exploring space. And I cheekily put the link in the chat to that. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's my contribution. Who am I handing to? Um, I would have liked to, you to have handed to Marika, but Marika is not with us, but she's a member of our group. So I would like uh, to ask you to hand it to Jesper, maybe. Jesper, yes, please. Just unmuting myself. Yes, uh, one point from all these uh, talking. I found it very difficult. I mean, you get uh, influenced by all the other people's cases and their thoughts and stuff like that. So if I should put, bless you, if I, put, <laughs> if I should put one point out, uh, I'll just see spotlight. Uh, I'm trying and I'm really not sure whether it makes sense. But uh, what came to my mind when we we're talking about macro uh, analysis and, and big scale and my experience in working with with organizations, it's um, what I call zooming in and zooming out. Uh, the assumptions that whatever happens in whatever direction you want to go, you are already doing something in the direction you hoped for. 
This is nothing new at all for a solution-focused practitioner. And I call that a being, being there. What is it I want? Why am I in this organization? Why am I in this society? Why am I in this country? And zooming out to say it's not just about me, 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 and uh, what I want out of it, but also about how I am connecting. So I'm also doing something in the direction others hope for and others I define as colleagues, as team, as department, as organization, as society, as country, world, etc. So it's this switch between actually what do I hope for and how am I doing something uh, in the direction others hope for. Others wish, well, I just call it hope for, uh, other than just uh, goals or intentions or what it is. And the whole question is, of course, how to do that. And I don't have an answer for that, but uh, of course, uh, it opens up. So, how do I zoom in? How do I zoom out? But I think the most important thing is to do it to be sure, um, am I at the right place? Am I where I want to do? Uh, am I living the life I want? And on the other hand, on how am I connecting to the surrounding world? So it's not just about me, it's just about how am I a part of what others want and what others are hoping for. I have no idea on how that makes sense to you. I'm very much inspired by Jonas Wells in, in what he says when he started up uh, his big project that's now nas- nationwide in Sweden, that not teaching anything about SF, not doing anything, but just behave, just be SF. In the emails you write, I mean, it was uh, when he shared that, it was really a big mind opening for me just down to the emails and to how you talk with people and just be trying to be in your behavior SF and let the rest of the people come and see if it makes sense to them. So of course, uh, what I've also learned in working with an organization is not to rush in and say, look at me, I'm the solution focused consultant. Now you do what it is more like looking at what do they hope for? What do they want to do? And then just be solution focused, whatever they come in. So that's a perfect handover to you, Jonas, isn't it? It was, wasn't it? Um, wow. And you already kind of told me a little bit, told everybody what I was, uh, my one point would be. Um, and it's this idea of, um, I want to bring it down to a more personal level uh, because I found in my own practice, and these are, I'm not trying to be prescriptive, I'm not trying to tell people what to do, but just my own learning process. Um, I think we need to be very serious about the work in ourselves. I mean, and, and one of the, my inspirations, uh, I was listening to a talk, um, Adrian Marie Brown, she's not working solution focused, but she works with large scale community um, change in, in the States. And she said something about, you know, tr- you have to transform yourself to transform the world. And it's, It sounds like a bit of a soundbite or maybe a stereotype kind of thing. But um, there is this sense of if you can be such a person, the best person you can be that so that change around you or in you or with people around you becomes irresistible. Then somehow that's a very powerful way of collaborating or having a relationship with other people. And, And I imagine working in my own my own history. Um, that there have been plenty of times that where, where my own personal alignment with what I think is beautiful or important or valuable is 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 created together with the people I'm working with. Um, so this is important for me to know what I want, how I want to be, or what I want to be in that space, and. And it comes with practice. I mean, I've been doing this work for 20 years. I didn't start by doing macro processes. I think I started with do, doing smaller things and then, you know, trying things out on a larger scale and larger scale. And somehow th- uh, things are clicking or th- things are working. Um, so I think it's important if I, if I want to give some kind of advice is that you are someone in some place, in some time, and you're working with some 
with with some bodies um, to just be aware, aware of the position that you're in and how you are collaborating with people around you, how you are, like Jesper was talking about, how you are connecting, how you are being, uh, because it all makes a huge difference in the kind of impact that you can have beyond the kind of process that you're working with. Um, um, I could say a lot more things, but I think I'm going to keep it a bit short. Um, there's plenty of things to be working on, working on humility, for instance, on your in your own learning, because we're also we're also enframed. You know, we don't know everything, we can't see everything, so we have to be very careful about making propositions beyond our own scope. So, you know, be, be humble. We could be wrong, and we all frequently are. So we need to be responsive and, re and responsible uh, for the people around us, be able to show that we are learning together, um, like um, Mark was talking about, that we're here on a level playing field. I'm also a learner. I'm also here trying to figure out how we can do this in the best possible way. Um, so there's a lot of partnershiping. And I'm very clear that I don't know exactly where to go. And that's scary. And it could be scary. But I think that's the kind of beauty of working solution focus, that we don't have to be afraid of that. That's something that we can actually build courage from and we can work together with people around us to create some kind of insecure, some kind of security in a process that's, that is very unpredictable. Um, and just be on the lookout for what's working and how, how things are getting together in in that unique process that you're in. I don't know if that's making any sense. Um, I'm sure Anton would like to build on that because I think he's doing similar kind of stuff or thinking in similar kind of ways. Um, so Anton, is this, uh, I don't know if I'm bringing this abruptly to you, but over to you. <laughs> it's okay. First of all, can you hear me? Because my microphone was a bit low. You can hear me, thanks. Um, I was very, uh, grateful to be part of this uh, macro analysis uh, study group uh, which started one year and a half ago because that was also the moment that we at Il Faro got the question from an organization to help them to um, uh, work on their management development. Um, it's an organization, they have 73 uh, leaders there in the organization, managers. They haven't done anything about leadership development in the past, so they thought it was uh, high time to change the leadership culture and to invite uh, several trainers to give propositions about how they would tackle it. And that was the moment when we started this, uh, this study group together as well. Um, I think the point I want to make is uh, be courageous enough to approach uh, large scale uh, changes in a solution focused way and not to be trapped into the expectations of the client organization. Uh, because when I went there, uh, everybody was thinking, oh, this is going to be a very difficult process. It's going to be complicated. We will have to assess everybody before they uh, step into the uh, leadership development. And then we will have to assess them afterwards and see if they can uh, still uh, be the leaders in the organizations and stuff like that. And the atmosphere is, was, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be complicated. and. Uh, and uh, uh, and for me, it was much more like they were looking at it in a very mechanistic way. Uh, there's this change process, and of course, we know in solution focus, uh, there's, there's others way, other ways to to deal with uh, change. One thing that helped me for the first uh, contact I had with uh, with a client and, and a bunch of people there in the organization was indeed Jonas' suggestion, uh, take care of your tone. Uh, so I went there and I was just thinking about, uh, I made a very short presentation about solution focus. Uh, I had that with me, but I was thinking tone, tone, tone when I was driving to Holland, uh, tone, tone, tone. What kind of tone do I want to convey? Uh, and the tone was, uh, I want to be friendly. I want to convey that this process can be light fun, enjoyable, that it will be successful and effective and that everybody will be um, part of it. Uh, and also uh, the tone or the idea of not knowing where this would go through uh, was very important for me. Uh, 
I know that they ask other consulting uh, com uh, organizations also to present their ideas and they all had uh, you know, roadmaps towards uh, leadership development and I didn't have any of that. Uh, my idea there was, uh, hey, um, is this, if this really is going to be a, a management development trajectory, uh, we do not know yet what will come out of it. Uh, but let's involve everybody. And this is also the idea that Mark has just been uh, talking about. So my suggestion was, let's go and discover what kind of leadership you want to have in your organization. Uh, I'm not here to tell you what kind of leadership that will be. Uh, we can call it solution focused leadership and I can give some training in solution focused leadership and feedback, coaching and team coaching and stuff like this. But and eventually in the process, uh, in, in the things that we did in that organization, that was part of it. So they did get some training in solution focused leadership. But I say that maybe 60% or more of the time that I spent there was time uh, that we took to talk to all the leaders involved there, everybody involved. Uh, and they, we did what we call success analyses with them. Uh, and these are conversations about what are signs of good leadership within your organizations? What are anecdotes that you can share about things that you did that worked well? What are anecdotes uh, that you can share about what others uh, did well in the organizations that are signs of the leadership that you want to see in the organization? So we, we had many in all sessions that we had there, uh, there was these success analysis. We gathered all these stories. These were all stories. And we disseminated these stories through blogs, through articles within the organization uh, with them. And that was so powerful because there they could see, oh, the leadership that we envision is the leadership that we care about, that we enjoy, that we can do. It's not rocket science. It's, uh, it's the things that we do. And these examples that we shared were so inspiring for them because it's the things that they do themselves and that they see others do. So the, we collected all these ideas and that was the leadership training we gave to them. So my point is uh, don't give training in leadership. Let people train themselves in the leadership they want to see within their organization. And that means let them share the stories about what they know about what works within their organization. And um, well, we're one and a half years later the 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 feedback is uh, is is very positive everybody's enthusiastic um, also one thing i have to mention is uh, we had a, a design group within the organization and we were just part of it so together with them uh, we were six in that design group and there were always two empty chairs and everybody every time that we got together with the design group to think about what are our next steps in this leadership development project um, the invitation was sent out to everybody and whoever wanted to uh, join in, uh, be they uh, in the leadership position or not, there were always two empty chairs where people could uh, participate in the conversation. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much, Anton. It's great to hear the how the story continued um, because when we started, you just began. Congratulations. So true to our um, our method, um, Anton also shared a case story, which we've been uh, doing uh, a lot. Now, the original idea, <clears throat> when we started, I remember um, it was uh, uh, Jonas who said, um, we've taken a solution focus out of the therapy room into the organization. Now, I want to take it out of the organization into the world. Yeah. And I thought, wow, I, I, to be quite honest, I don't want to take it out of the organization. I want to keep it in the organization because I think organizations are fantastic places for social innovation. Yeah? So to, work, to continue working, refining our practice on how to do the broad brush strokes of large organizational uh, change, but also the, the small brush strokes of doing the, the tools and the conversations, all, all the in-between bits, and then to have the, the personality or the, the being that shines in all these processes. I think, you know, we, we're always working with the world. 
Yeah, whenever, you know, when we work with the Supreme Court, we work with the judiciary system. When we work with an organization, we work with the lives of all the people in it, the suppliers, the all these. And if we bear that in mind, I think we can think a bit more broadly and maybe we can also have more impact by being aware of that. So um, we, are in, we want to learn from you now. Um, and uh, I would love, I'd like to ask Jesper, uh, we agreed that we will divide, uh, we'll have groups, yeah, and I would like to ask you, we would like to ask you to share your one point, your observations, your insights, um, your very seasoned practitioners, as I can see, so we're really, really interested in what is your, what are your insights, what are your learnings about uh, large scale macro change, uh, whatever we call it. It's something just came to mind quickly. I remember learning from Olivia, and I can't remember her last name now, but she was part of a group that we had uh, working on um, climate change um, in London, uh, and and um, Aisha and the family based systems. It's on it's on there. A conversation with her, and she said something really cool. She's seventeen years old, and she managed to organise a huge part of London around a campaign against uh, an incinerator. And she did one thing that was really cool and really fits well with this workshop too, that she didn't work with individuals. She works with groups. And I just found that was just a magical insight from a 17 year old uh, in a world which is really hard and tough. And, and she just gets engaged with groups. So she gets engaged with people that are already organized in groups. And it really verbates with my example that I was already connecting with other other groups or councils or committees or agencies they're already organized in groups and then getting those groups to, to you know intergroup with each other uh, and in a way so just break that idea of working with individuals we're actually working with with teams or with you know with uh, um, and in order to create you know macro change faster i just thought that was great i'm uh, sorry you asked for insight I, I don't know if that was worth it but there you go <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm ready now. So, welcome back. I don't know about you, Susan, or Jonas, Anton, Mark, but I would be curious to hear what uh, happened. I mean, no report, for God's sake, no report. <clears throat> but what inspired you and in what you heard in your groups? We have about uh, nine minutes left. Oh, man. I mean, what a group. Uh, Jenny and Jacqueline. Um, I think we were all, it was vibrant. There was, a, there was an energy there that was amazing. Um, and I think one of the things that all, that kind of, there was a tone that went through um, our space was this idea of, I love that Je Jacqueline said, you know, let the magic, let the, let the sparkling emerge from you. Let it out. You know, I just thought this embodied kind of sensational, you know, be being with your with your coworkers or co collaborators. Uh, and and she and I loved how she she started with your eyes open. You know, there's there's something about the gaze. There's something about the you know how you connect with your soul and with or whatever that is, and with the people around you. Um, I love that. And then Jenny just went, oh. We've got to talk about the physicality of things. Yeah, it's, it's not just a, it's, it's not a wording space. It's actually a space that people move in, and you know they move their bodies around in. And how do we create that space? And, you know, and connecting with Mark's uh, exploratory space, I thought it was beautiful. Uh, there was this, there's so much communication involved in um, kind of macro change, uh, and it's just beautiful. Um, and we got a live demo. Uh, actually, our little thing was a live demo. How 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 can we start on a in a good way to get change going it was beautiful anyway does that uh, does this does sound like a little report but i think it's also an, it's a little bit of an example a case as well okay. Jacqueline, we'll give you like that oh, sorry go on yes but go on no i'll just give you a soft warning for recording <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> oh we're extending the energy into this yeah room. so what inspiration did you find yeah, Susan. There's Roy wants to say something. 
Sure. Okay. So I'm just going to quote Annie, who had to go to serve a client. Um, when she built on what Anton was saying, which is beautiful, by the way, um, saying how she thought the most important thing was helping people to learn to co create. Mm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. What inspired you in this group? Mm -hmm. What did you hear? I had the privilege to talk to Stephanie and Marco about uh, their points. Um, Marco's point was, um, I don't know, but we know. Huh? So go into an organization like this. And we all remember his beautiful case uh, in Oxford when he was talking about his uh, uh, or work with uh, an Indian company. Um, Stephanie's idea was uh, work with an organization wherever they are, even though they are in a very traditional way of uh, working on change, go there and start pick it up from there and give it a solution focused twist. Um, and also another idea by Marco is uh, make people more confident that they can make a difference themselves uh, so uh and, so that idea and i was listening with uh with an ear focused on uh, how can we apply all this to climate change and uh, i think that makes the uh that makes a very important and relevant case yeah what other points came out what in other your points discussions? I think I was in a group where with Emma and uh, Matt, and I think they discovered each other. <laughs> Seems to, in the way of working. And sorry to push you a bit forward, Emma, but you mentioned this about aha moments. You had a client who would say, "What would they like to notice or have more of?" It was these aha moments. And just before that, you mentioned, "Ah, oh, Anton mentioned this about success indicator. Uh, I wish just how to do it." And to me, what I heard in your stories was just like, hey, you're already doing it, interviewing this client. So so how would you notice that these aha moments come? What would you look for? What would you see? What would you experience when this aha moment comes? So I'm thinking, hey, wow, it's so brilliant. And Anson put a language on it, calling it success indicators. Success and all of a sudden, analysis. Oh, sorry, success analysis. And all of a sudden, I just realized this happened already in Emma's story. It was very inspiring. Yeah, and likewise on that, Jesper, in that, the thing that stuck with me was this, because we were talking about how do you measure change and how do you measure progress? And the kind of, what we came back to was a kind of, you measure it by asking people what the measurements are and then, you try and get it from someone who doesn't understand how to measure it, but they've got an idea and you explain it and you talk about it until that becomes something that you can all buy into. And that's not easy, but it at least mm -hmm. gave me something to kind of <laughs> start with, or at least to kind of focus a conversation on next time around. So yeah, it was a really useful conversation. Yeah. And I just was thinking that comfort with the unknown is useful because as we were discussing in our in our group, I've since the project began, I've noticed certain things which I feel now, having seen them, are signs of progress. But at the beginning, we could never have guessed and written down this will be a marker of it. But when you see it, you kind of know it. Um, mm. We were having an interesting conversation and you won't be surprised to know it included some reference to jazz and improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I thought, it, so what I guess what inspired me was we, we were talking about developing a culture for experimentation within organizations. And um, we were, I, my, my frame of reference is often how four people can move between leading and following uh, to create change in organizations. And uh, Mark McCurgo in our group was talking about uh, an unusual, unique um, concert 
he attended recently, which he also reviewed, which involved 20 musicians uh, trying to navigate this dynamic between leading and following to create change. And all of the uh, the challenges that, that, that is m maybe more representative of a normal organization, because they're quite big, um, of you know deeply listening, being deeply present and in the moment, uh, which we all need to do uh, to, to to be happy and to flourish and to to, to transform ourselves and our organisations, and uh, so I was therefore quite inspired by this idea of bringing twenty musicians together uh, as a lens uh, to, to to reflect a, a real organisation, as opposed to the 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 four musicians I bring together in my experiential sessions. So there's something beautiful that's evolved from that as a, as a way of looking at the world, and to uh, and to inspire change within teams and organisations as well. So thank you to, uh, to to my group for that. I want to thank Rolf and uh, Jerry and Ching Li for interesting our interesting conversations. I really found your comment, Rolf, inspiring. You talked about the fine granularity, yeah, breaking things down. I think it's similar to. Um, details in coaching conversations is to break it down to find small small little initiatives and also what you said Jerry, about get, creating this excitement yeah giving people the feeling that we're doing something interesting and something exciting and we're connecting small groups that maybe exist already or that we are forming so that um, change can go on its way. So I would like to thank you all for joining us. It's been also really uh, uh, insightful for us. I think we should let you go so you can hop to the next uh, conversations, to the next session. And I hope that we will um, meet again in some other in other contexts. Have a, have a wonderful conference. Thank you, thank to everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. 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 Thank you, everyone.